reading from the Acts of the Apostles. When the time for Pentecost was fulfilled, they were all in one place together, and suddenly there came from the sky a noise like a strong driving wind, and it filled the entire house in which they were. Then there appeared to them tongues as of fire, which parted and came to rest on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in different tongues as the Spirit enabled them to proclaim. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven staying in Jerusalem. At this sound they gathered in a large crowd, but they were confused because each one heard them speaking in his own language. They were astounded and in amazement they asked, are not all these people who are speaking Galileans? Then how does each of us hear them in his native language? We are Parthians, Medes, Elamites, inhabitants of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the districts of Libya near Cyrene, as well as travelers from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, yet we hear them speaking in our own tongues of the mighty acts of God. The word of the Lord. A reading from the first letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. Brothers and sisters, no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. There are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but the same Spirit. There are different forms of service, but the same Lord. There are different workings, but the same God, who produces all of them and everyone. To each individual, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for some benefit. As a body is one, though it has many parts, and all the parts of the body, though many, are one body, so also Christ. For in one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slaves or free persons, and we were all given to drink of one spirit. The word of the Lord.
The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the doors were locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit, whose sins you forgive are forgiven them, and whose sins you retain are retained. The Gospel of the Lord. Before diving into our meditation tonight in earnest, I want to make a brief, but of course an important reference to, of course, the civil strife that is uh, plaguing our country in these last days. And as with any preaching on Pentecost, you know, you, you want and you could say so much, uh, but there's not time. Uh, so what one strand do we pull? What one thing might we pray about in the midst of all this? And, and the thing that keeps coming back in my prayer is this. There's no one answer. There's no one answer. In a republic, the only way that the nation moves forward, and in particular, the only way that a nation can move forward from its sins and from its past inequities is if every citizen holds as sacred their responsibility to give completely for the sake of their neighbors. Whether that means in legal justice, whether that means in service of the poor, whether that means in helping our neighbors physically on a day-to-day -day basis, whether it means through the instruments of the state to, to say, yes, I, I will live with less so that others may live with enough. Those are just some of the many, many infinite beginnings of a solution to what we face. And I don't know, and that, that's left to people far smarter than I, and it's left to the proper province of the state to discern those things. But what I can say as a priest and as a leader of a community and what I pray we can all pray about and commit ourselves to as community is this. Whether we're Christians or not, as citizens, we have a sacred, it's not a secular, it is a sacred obligation to hold in trust the good and well-being of each and every one of our neighbors in every decision that we make and in every vote that we take. And if we can pray on this Pentecost, that the Holy Spirit might inform that decision-making process, then as a church, we may begin in our homes, in our civic organizations, in our church communities, in our uh, political assemblies, we might begin to inform the conversation in the way that our founders intended for us, for the good and well-being of all. We pray for particular, uh, in particular for safety tonight for our beloved city, our Washington, our capital, that it may shine as a place of fairness, safety, and prosperity for all. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Over the weeks of social distancing, I've been thinking a lot about relationships. I suppose we all have, right? I mean, e even if only at the beginning from the fact that we've been distanced from our normal relating with, with other people, right? Um, 
Making Zoom contact with long lost friends was one example, actually. I had a two hour conversation with friends from high school that I haven't seen uh, or heard from in many cases in 10 years. And it brought me back not only to the sense of how that was missing in my life, but also back to those beautiful heady days, to the furnace of adolescence, to the, the place where our identities are formed in such beautiful ways by our friends, by our relationships, sometimes gently coaxing us in the right direction, sometimes hammering us in that direction, and sometimes causing us to fall all too quickly in the wrong directions. Um, nonetheless, important, right? Absolutely important. I miss my friends very much. I've been spending more time talking with family. I've been missing most of my parishioners and wondering how to improve relations with some of the others when they return. I've questioned the role of the physical in relationships, right? Are you a hugger? Are you a handshaker? Are you somebody who just yearns to see the mouth of another person when they speak to you, right? Um, what role does the physical play in all of our, our relationships? And likewise, what are the effects of all of this short-term, long-term, etc.? I've had a blessed opportunity to really take time in the garden of the parish, praying with penitents who have come for confession. We've received penitents here every single day of the pandemic, coming for confession, coming for counsel, and that will continue. Other times, I've had a chance to meet with parishioners there and chat with them over various topics, with parishioners and people that I've met on the street while walking my dog along different routes than usual because the parks have been shut down. I've been able to talk about a lot of different things. I've been able to dive deep with married couples in need to question and examine contemporary topics with parishioners and neighbors, things like open relationships and, and what is love really and how do I live with roommates and all sorts of things like this. I've been able to probe family histories with them and addictions with them. This time of social distance has been remarkably relational. I've also noticed relationship markers in my own individual life. Friendships long past, I made reference to some of that a moment ago. People I'd like to know so much better. A frustration that most people look to their priests for a purely transactional relationship. It's one of the poverties that we live with as priests, is that when people come to us, they see us as a means to an end or an instrument to receive what they need, and that's part of our sacrifice. But at the same time, times like this make you think, it would be nice to have friends and not just clients, as it were. And of course, trying to grow my own most important relationship the relationship with the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Relationships are a big deal for us, and the power of our individual experiences, the power of our subjective relational awareness, only points toward its objective importance. This is real. The, the Greeks taught us this. When something is important to everybody in the whole human race, that means it is objectively important. And relationships definitely fall into that category. And for us as Christians, that makes particular sense because God, our God, is a living relationship. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, who we celebrate today. The Spirit is the stuff of the relationship between the Father and the Son. And because we're talking about God, that stuff is so strong, the relationship between the Father and the Son is so strong, it actually has its own personality in the Holy Spirit. The Spirit, the author of all relationship, descended on the apostles this day, all those years ago, and established the church among them. It's an amazing thing, this relationship that we call the church. Pope Benedict said this frequently. He said, the church, the Christian faith, 
is not a problem to be solved or an argument to be made. He pointed out it is a relationship to be had with Jesus the Christ. And the founding of the church on Pentecost, when the relational stuff of the Trinity descended upon the apostles, speaks to that truth. We are a people of relationship. In anticipation, we pray of an eternal relationship with the Holy Trinity that we call heaven. Now, ethereal, as the Holy Spirit may seem, this builder and bonder of relationships, he is remarkably concrete. If we're going to build and maintain relationships and, just, and thus the joy and the peace that they bring, thus the practice that they are for heaven, if we're going to build and maintain relationships rooted in that Holy Spirit, we need to be likewise concrete. So tonight I want to look at some of the concrete stuff of the Holy Spirit to guide us in bettering our relationships, including that most important of relationships, the church herself. First, to be in relationship, we need to be with other people. The apostles were gathered in the upper room and the doors were locked for fear of the crowds. They had to actually be with each other for the Holy Spirit to do his work. Now that might seem like an obvious sort of a thing, but in the world in which we find ourselves, it's not as easy as we think. To be with other people. One of the things I loved most about my high school friends is that we could be quiet with each other. We could sit and read for hours at, at the beach, or we could talk about nothing or drive you know, long, long distances without saying a word, and yet there was something there. There was a fire, there was an energy there between us that gave birth to our adult selves. Such powerful, beautiful friendship, being with each other. And yet this being stands opposed to the virtual relationships of social media. Now it's one thing, you know, one sort of degree of removal to be in a Zoom meeting with somebody you know and you're talking face to face, right? But I'm talking about the virtual relationships that we form with people who have never known us and cannot truly claim to love us. Media people, political leaders, right? False preachers that, that claim to want everything for us but really only want profit for themselves. It's a remarkable thing how the beginnings and the appearances of relationship can trick the human mind into committing completely. We run after what they offer, right? It's an amazing thing. We see this in the church. If anybody's ever heard of Catholic Twitter, I'll tell you it's anything but, right? It, it's a place where false preachers and craziness kind of reigns. But people, it, it, it pulls at the strings of what a real relationship is like and people run after it. And instead of building up the church as the ultimate relationships are meant to do, it ends up tearing people apart from each other. And it's not just in the church. It's in political realities as well. Identity politics focuses not on our identity as fellow citizens loving and sacrificing for each other, but saying, I'm here, I'm here, this is my tribe, and I will defend my tribe to, to the detriment of all others, even if it means tearing the nation apart and causing us to hate each other. Identity politics is a false, digitally mastered relationship. And it, it says, look, there are good things that it, it begins by, by preying on, things that should be developed, beautiful, but it takes things and twists them and leads to where we are today in many cases. Being with real people, loving the people in front of you, not hating an abstraction far away from you, serving the people in front of you, not demanding something else from other people you've never met or seen. That is what it means to be with other people in the upper room of our own hearts, together in each other's physical presence, in neighborhoods, in, in parks, in, in wonderful places, to be with one another. To be with one another opposes another false set of relationships, the relationship of pornography. 
It's not something we talk about very often, but it needs to be. And it affects everybody, men and women across our entire country. Again, it takes good things that human beings need. Love, communion, joy, respite. And it preys on those good things and blows them up and twists them. And what's so insidious about it is that people actually begin to enter into a quasi, this psychology has proven this, into a quasi-relationship, and yet they know there's not even anybody on the other side of it. It's bizarre. And as if that weren't enough proof, as if the real logic of it weren't enough proof, we know that since the era of pornography began, at least among American men, their capacity to engage in real relationships with their spouses or would-be spouses has descended through the floor, as has medically, physiologically, their capacity to conceive the next generation. You see, the enemy always ends up revealing himself, even in the most perverse of ways. But to be in a real relationship stands opposed to this and is what the church proposes for everyone, a real relationship that gives life at the psychological level, at the social level, and ultimately gives life in the production of the next generation. To be with each other also opposes the digital hookup culture. And I know, because I talk to a lot of young adults. I, I talk to them as they come through the garden. In these days, I talk to them in spiritual direction. Everybody agrees the dating scene in Washington sucks. Okay, it's terrible, it's horrible. Nobody, I've never met somebody who said, oh, I love living in Washington because dating there is so great. And what do they do? They descend into, out of desperation, out of wanting something that is good, out of wanting relationship. We descend into flip, 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 flock, right? We, we descend into th this, this morass of the, the digital hookup culture, which doesn't even actually lead to real relationships usually. It usually just leads to something that ends 24, 48 hours later, how many conversations later? Perhaps never even meeting the person. Where was the relationship in the end, right? We would be so much happier. I, our psyches would be so relieved. Our hearts and souls would be so, so relieved if we just loved the people we are being with physically, in their presence. You might or might not meet Mr. Wright or Miss Wright right away, or ever. I, I can't promise that. But I can promise you that what you will find in a real relationship is infinitely happier than the traps that these three things lead us into. As life resumes and our social distances shrink, do not miss this opportunity, brothers and sisters, dear friends, ask, am I physically with people? And not only physically with people, my time with others needs to be psychologically substantial. They were there for fear of the crowds. Guys, they feared for their lives when they were together and the Holy Spirit descended on them. There was emotional vulnerability among the apostles and Mary in those days. There was the humility of knowing they might die in the next hour. They were dealing with life and death. The departure of Jesus 10 days earlier at the Ascension. Life with his mother. How are we supposed to look her in the eye as we ran away? And now she's with us loving us. They were dealing with real stuff and it was opened up to them. And they didn't know what the mystery of the church would be. They didn't know that from those 12, there would be 1.2 billion of us. Now, not all of our relationships will be quite that heavy, thank God. But do I have any that could go to those places, to those depths? Do I have people with whom I can be meek, with whom I can live the Beatitudes, with whom I can mourn, with whom I can explore what it means to be me, what it means to be a human person. To be in relationship, we need to be with others, physically present and psychologically substantial. 
The fruits of the Spirit provide another concrete guide to where is and isn't relationship. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. These are the fruits of the Holy Spirit that St. Paul enunciates in the letter to the Galatians. Are my relationships immersed in these things? These are concrete things. You know them, I know them. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, control. We, we know what, where these things are and where they are not. Are my relationships immersed in these, or do I find myself overcome by anger, impatience, infidelity, harshness, a lack of patience, a lack of control, any of these things? And we know where those things are. And for each of us, it's a bit of a tangle. But if we take a moment, we can't lie to ourselves. And if we look at those relationships and say, how do I dial up those good things of the Holy Spirit? And how do I dial down the others? Those are concrete clues to which relationships need to be kept, which ones need to be honed, and which ones need to be ended and mourned. I see this in the world and among Catholics. It can be insidious when someone cloaks himself in the outward appearance of the church, whether it's a so-called traditionalist or a so-called social justice crusader. And a conversation with that person bears none of the fruits of the spirit. In fact, it usually feels more like you're talking to somebody on a cable news show. If you feel like you're talking to somebody on a cable news show when you're having a conversation, you are not in a Holy Spirit relationship, okay? <laughs> there are better things to be, to be engaged in. I remember in college, I studied at GW, we all loved politics, we all loved debating, and I was in the honors dorm, yes. But we'd sit up late into the night, screaming at each other across the dorm hallway about who was right and whose position was the, and one night I realized we didn't even care who was right or what positions we held. We were high on the adrenaline. See, it had been twisted, and we weren't having a real relationship with each other. So again, if your relationship feels more like a talk show, stop it. If my relationships don't bear that resemblance to the Holy Trinity, they won't bring me happiness on earth or eternal fulfillment in heaven. And one last guide to Holy Spirit relationships, the words of our Lord himself. Receive the Holy Spirit, whose sins you forgive are forgiven them. A Holy Spirit-based relationship is always about forgiveness, about being ever more reconciled to one another. Hone the practice of forgiveness among you. The Holy Spirit and, and this forgiveness what does it look like? I can tell you very concretely exactly what it looks like. It looks like the cross. That's what the love of Jesus looks like, that he would die in order to forgive our sins, that he could be the lamb of sacrifice to satisfy the justice of God instead of us. That's what forgiveness looks like. That's what the Holy Spirit wants us to exercise with each other and for each other in our relationships. Each time we forgive each other, we die and resurrect a little bit until one day we can offer up our own actual physical debt for the sake of our loved ones and for the next generation. It's good practice for our final end. He gave us his unique brand of relationship that we might be one, undivided. If we see division, we need to heal it. If we are instruments of division, we need to repent. And finally, just a personal invite, because in that upper room, they were gathered under the guidance of one very, very special person who understood all of this better than anyone who ever walked the earth. They were under the guidance of Mary herself, the first and greatest leader of the church on earth after the ascension of Jesus was Mary, our mother. And here at the church of Mary, the mother of God, Okay? To be Catholic means to be a master of relationship. To be in this school of the church, which is a school 
of relationships. And that is all that we want to do as a church, whether it's with the poorest of the poor or those who have fallen due to their immense wealth or anybody in between. I don't care where you're coming from. I don't care what your background is. I don't care what sins you may or may not have committed. Under the guidance of Mary, our mother, and remember, they partook in the death of her son, and she welcomed them back with open arms. And so likewise, her church. The doors are always open. The garden is always open. And the arms are always open for us to come together and practice being with each other, living the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and forgiving one another on earth until we enter into the greatest of relationships that there is, the communion of the Trinity in heaven. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.
charged with the public safety and the health and well-being of our medical system, that God grant them the reward of their good work, and that he grant them wisdom and prudence in the service of the common good. We pray to the Lord. We pray for our parish community that God grant us hearts alive and a fire of the Holy Spirit to enter into deep and abiding on 